Hi everyone, my name is Dave and welcome to Extra Credit, a video series where we take an unscripted look at topics related to local history and exploring that history. All right, so as we normally do before we start the episode, just a quick reminder to visit my website. You'll find a link in the description. There's all kinds of content on there related to the topics we take a look at in this video series, as well as the subjects of my hikes. Uh, additionally, you're going to find a section there for extra credit, and uh, there you'll find all kinds of links to previous episodes uh, of this series. So if you haven't seen them or if you want to look back and revisit an episode uh, that we took a look at in the past, you can do so. Uh, as well, you can find me on social media. So make sure you follow me on Facebook, uh, on Twitter, and on Instagram. And finally, if you haven't already done so, please make sure you subscribe to the channel and turn on the notification button. Uh, there's all kinds of content that drops regularly on the channel um, that sometimes takes a while to make it out on social media. By subscribing and turning on your notifications, you'll get that content uh, as quickly as it comes out. Okay, so the topic of today's episode is uh, a revisit or a part two. Uh, so a couple of years ago, right when we actually started the series, I did an episode on photography. And in that episode, I talked a little bit about, <laughs> and here comes Luna. Uh, she wants to play. She's got her toy. Um, she's all excited because we're all at camp and she got to run around. She's all kind of sopping wet because she's running through the snow. Um, so we did do an episode on photography. And I did talk a little bit about my history with photography, that I've been doing it for a very long time. And the fact that photography is a very integral part uh, of a lot of the hikes uh, that I do. And so I, I went through kind of talking a little bit about sort of some of the technology that I use, some of the cameras I use starting way back, um, you know, from the beginning when I was, you know, just using, so, you know, sort of a little point and shoot camera and then purchasing my first sort of single lens reflex camera, SLR camera, you know. Uh, using film, manual focus, and then eventually upgrading into a uh, autofocus camera. Uh, and then from there, moving into digital, right? I went through the whole sort of gamut. I talked a little bit about kind of using my phone as well. Uh, and we're going to kind of talk a little bit about some of those topics again. But what we're going to do is we're going to kind of get into a little bit more about using cameras uh, for the um, type of um, hiking and the type of um, work that I do, which is revolving around kind of historical documentation. Um, just trying to keep the dog uh, amused here as she, you know, cuddles in my lap here and coughs and snorts and does all those kinds of things. So uh, as I was saying, um, Photography is a big part of the explorations, the historical explorations that I do. Uh, obviously, I want to be able to document uh, all that information and obviously, um, you know, using a camera and recording it, um, you know, in the past recording it on film and then probably for the last, you know, 20 years recording that information digitally is a big, big part of, um, you know, preserving uh, that that history. Um, <laughs> Uh, additionally, um, I've already done episodes on this and we're going to come back to this as well. Uh, I do do um, videos and so um, photography is important because I use the photographs that I take uh, to augment the videos, um, to kind of put photographs in the videos. And additionally, when I post them to YouTube, uh, I, use the, uh, uh, I use the photographs as the thumbnails oftentimes for the, uh, for the video itself. So it is kind of a very integral part of what I do uh, in terms of my historical documentation. So uh, let's talk a little bit about the, uh, the technology. So in my previous episode, I talked a little bit about the fact that I use two um, devices uh, to, to do photography. Uh, so I do use an SLR camera and I do use my phone. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about both of those. Um, so in terms of my phone, I did show, sorry, the phone, the camera, I did show you the camera before. Um, in, in terms of the technology, my camera now is almost kind of like a museum piece. Uh, it is 13 years old. Uh, it is time for me to maybe look at purchasing a new SLR camera. Um, the only problem that I have is just trying to sort of justify that. There's so many other things uh, that I need to purchase. So in the last few years, uh, I've po purchased my drone uh, that I use. Uh, and even that's a couple of years old now, um, or even three years old, because I kind of bought it um, later in the model year. And so um, my drone is kind of a little bit behind in the technology 
I've bought uh, a couple of GoPros in the last bunch of years uh, to, to do my video recordings, right? So there's always things to sort of spend money on and, and certainly a, an SLR is, is a big purchase. So at the time, um, just purchasing the body of the camera was um, um, $1,100, $1,200 purchase. And that's basically what they run. I mentioned that this is kind of a prosumer model. So this was a, a Nikon D90. And it's kind of like um, kind of a bridge between kind of the the, the more kind of uh, amateur end um, sort of the basic models and then kind of in between sort of some of the higher end models. Um, it still works very well. It's still great. Um, I, I've mentioned before that I, I've sort of gravitated more towards my phone simply because I'm doing a lot of my hiking by bike and I find it very awkward with all the other things that I'm carrying, uh, very awkward to carry the, the camera with me um, in a way that it's accessible and not getting in a way in, in the way of the biking. Um, but anyway, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about the camera and I wanted to talk a little bit about more specifically when you're doing this type of historical documentation. I did touch on this a little bit in the last episode, but I kind of want to elaborate on it a little bit more. Uh, you need to have the right lens. Obviously the, the, the idea or the big, you know, plus with a, a single lens reflex camera is the ability to change lenses uh, and to, you know, get the right lens for the right situation. So um, if you're shooting action shots, if you're, you know, into that type of photography, uh, you know, having the right type of zoom lens uh, to facilitate that. If you're into taking portraits uh, and things like that, you want to have the right lens. So the same thing goes when you're doing the type of work that I am that I guess could be sort of considered kind of landscape photography. Um, you want to have the correct type of lens. So the lens that I'm using right now uh, is actually not a Nikon lens. There are Nikon ones. Um, I bought an off-brand one because it's a little bit cheaper. Um, so this is a Tokina lens. Uh, it is a 12 to 24 magnification and uh, the f-stop is four. So it is a fairly quick lens. Um, obviously, again, the more money you spend, you, I, I believe you can probably get something from Nikon that is in the same zoom range, but have a, has a much lower f-stop. So you're, you know, you're looking at something maybe in a 2.8 range uh, that obviously, obviously gives you, um, you know, more of an ability to uh, to shoot in darker conditions and things like that. I, I found that this one was fine. Um, certainly with digital cameras and the ability to to basically change your ISO to change your 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 speed. Um, you know, given the, the certain situation, um, that's alleviated a lot of the problems. I remember in the old days when you were shooting film and you were trying to, you know, do something outside in the bright, bright sunshine and you needed kind of a 100 speed film or, you know, something that was a lot more sort of, um, uh, you know, adaptable to the bright conditions. And then you went somewhere dark and then all of a sudden you're having a hard time photographing it because uh, the film speed is too low and you need something with a higher ISO, right? You need something in a you know, 400, 800 range. So that was a real pain using film. Certainly a lot better when you're using the digital technology. Anyway, um, so one of the big things you need to keep in mind, first of all, is if you're using a digital camera, uh, a lot of the lower end ones uh, have a cropped sensor. So this does have a DX sensor. So it's a cropped sensor. It's, so it's not a full size sensor that you'll see on a lot of the higher end cameras. So the 12 to 24 range is not the same as it would be back when you were using film. Uh, so the 12 to 24 would work out to be an 18 to 36 millimeter zoom kind of using the full sensor or going back to the old sort of film days um so uh you have to sort of keep that in mind um just kind of watching the dog trying to kind of keep herself amused um so but certainly this is a very wide angle zoom compared to the sort of the old days. So I know like, for example, when I was using film, um, you know, a, a wide angle lens was considered like, you know, 28 millimeters, right? And when you got beyond 28 millimeters, you were kind of getting in sort of the ultra wide angle uh, aspect, right? So this is certainly gives you a very wide uh, field of view. And again, that's very important when you're doing this type of photography, because oftentimes you're going to find yourself um, in very, very sort of cramped conditions. Um, you're going to want to have, again, that wider field, field of view and sort of a very narrow type of area. Uh, again, the dog is just... You know, she's killing me here. She's playing with her toys. She's trying to keep herself amused and making all kinds of noise uh, while I'm trying to record. Um, anyway, so for example, when I'm doing the, the railway grade, right? And you're trying to take a picture and you're trying to get 
for example, a bridge, you're trying to get a, a rock cut or you're trying to get some sort of feature in there and you're trying to get as wide of angle as possible, you're going to need that very wide angle lens to be able to capture that. Um, and again, having a little bit of zoom involved in there is always very helpful, right? Because it allows you to kind of manipulate things without having to step back or step forward. Uh, oftentimes you're going to find yourself in a situation where you're not going to be able, just given the, the constraints, you're not going to be able to um, back up enough um, you know, or to physically move yourself enough to get everything in the frame of the picture, right? So uh, I, I'm thinking of, um, and I'm going to be doing an episode on this in the future, uh, some of my explorations with the Pigeon River Lumber Company and the Gunflint Lake Superior Railroad. Um, you're going to find yourself uh, in, uh, for example, uh, the logging camp that I discovered in Minnesota, camp number eight, and you're trying to photograph the remains uh, of, uh, and I'll flash some pictures up on the screen here, you're trying to photograph the remains uh, of a structure and you know you don't really have the room to back up because it's all amongst the trees right and there's sort of nowhere for you to go and you need that wide angle perspective to be able to uh to do that so again if you are using a uh, an slr camera uh and you are doing this type of work really consider getting yourself a a very wide angle lens there's a lot of options that are out there again there are the actual brands so whether you're using uh, a nikon or a canon or whatever the brand that you're using um there's obviously the manufactured ones right from the manufacturer or there's the off brands um you know uh, there's all kinds of ones Tekina, sigma uh etc uh again i probably not as involved with the uh slr world as i used to be uh because i'm spending a lot of my time lately more into kind of the video end of things and uh so uh and again um not using the slr as much as i used to um uh, it's just not sort of a big part of my repertoire anymore. Uh, but anyway, uh, certainly something to consider when you're um, out doing this type of photography. Okay, so uh, let's move on to talking uh, a little bit about um, using your phone. So uh, phones have really revolutionized um, photography uh, because in the past, essentially you needed a dedicated piece of equipment to do photography, right? Um, you know, phones have now become sort of this all-in-one type of apparatus where essentially you have everything at your disposal, uh, including a phone. And the technology in the phones has increased right, quite dramatically. Um, you know, I can think back to, you know, when I had my first phone that had a camera in it and the pictures you were taking with that, uh, uh, comparatively speaking to, to now, right? Like I can remember, uh, I don't even remember the, the earliest phone that I had a camera on, but I can remember when I got my first Blackberry, uh, if we're going back in ancient history here. And so I can remember that Blackberry, I think it was 2011, I got my first Blackberry and, you know, taking photographs with it and, you know, and having all, all of the, you know, um, you know, the, the, the time and the date and the, the location and all that stuff recorded on the camera, which, uh, on the phone, which was a great, uh, plus, uh, but certainly we've seen a lot of uh, upgrades with regard to the camera technology. The dog's in my lap here again. Um, and so we've seen, you know, the progression just even in the last few years, moving from one camera on the phone to multiple cameras on the phone. Uh, and that sort of made a huge breakthrough. Um, uh, I can show you my phone here because normally I use my phone to record these videos. And what I've done is I've brought my old phone out and using that to record the videos can actually show you things on my current phone. Um, I'm not really going to get into um, talking about sort of um, advantages and disadvantages of different types of phones, whatever it works for you. Uh, I use an iPhone. I've been using an iPhone since 2013. It's always worked well for me. Um, I mean, obviously everybody has their, their favorites, whether it's Android or iOS or whatever the situation may be. Uh, but again, you're going to basically find a lot of comparability between the different types of phones and, and a lot of their different types of features. Um, so the first thing I want to talk a little bit about is um, protecting your phone. Um, the type of explorations, the type of hiking that I do, I'm very, very hard uh, on my device. Um, I've talked a little bit about um, what I do with it. I do have a little holder uh, on my bike that I put the phone on. I do have a pouch on my tactical vest where I will slip it into if I need to get off the bike. But um, basically I'm doing a lot of sort of rough and tumble stuff. And so I can be kind of hard on the phone. So for me, it's very important to have a case on the phone uh, to protect it. Again, there's a lot of different options when it comes to cases and even the manufacturers themselves have a lot of different variations. Uh, I'm currently using a life proof case. 
Um, I've used um, LifeProof for quite a number of years. Again, there's a lot of different models. Um, I believe this is the, the Fray model, which is kind of one of the more kind of armored uh, versions. Uh, so it does have a fully uh, encased uh, um, case. Uh, so basically the screen is protected. Uh, the backside is protected as well. Um, again, it apparently does have a, uh, a lifetime warranty. I have broken uh, the actual phone that I'm using to record this video now. I did break the screen, uh, dropping it from a, uh, uh, actually from sort of chest level, uh, I cracked the uh, the front screen, even with the case on it. So you do have to be careful with, uh, even with a case on it, um, but certainly it does give you a lot of, um, uh, a lot more peace of mind when you're using that. Uh, the only drawbacks that I find that using the uh, the case is I do find that uh, oftentimes uh, over time, uh, the oils and things in, like, in your hand will kind of deteriorate the front part of the screen. So I've had this case since I've got this phone. So the current phone that I'm using is an iPhone, uh, iPhone 13 Pro. Um, it was a bit of an upgrade over my last phone. So the phone that I'm using to record is an iPhone 11, just a standard iPhone 11 with the two cameras. Uh, I upgraded to the Pro model because I wanted the three camera cameras and I'll explain a little bit about that in a second. So the only real drawback that I find to this is that as cameras, phones have moved to multiple cameras, the opening where the cameras are has become bigger and bigger and bigger. Now the problem with that is it creates a very big surface area here that the, the case needs to be able to protect. And that causes some problems, right? So uh, in the old days, when you only had the one phone on the camera, typically the camera opening uh, was only this big, right? And so you, you didn't really have a lot of problems. And I found this starting back with uh, this phone that I'm using to record my iPhone 11. Uh, I was out hiking and all of a sudden I found there was, I could notice something was going on with my photographs. And so what had happened was the plastic cover over the cameras had gotten scratched over time. And obviously that was causing the dog is still driving me crazy here. She's pulling out every single toy that she has here and uh, obviously wants me to try to play with her and, um, you know, kind of keep her amused and stuff like that. Um, just life with dogs, right? And so I, I found that all the pictures were coming out all blurry and I was actually doing a hike. And so I was out on the former Grand Trunk Pacific Line, uh, later the, the, the Graham subdivision. And I was hiking uh, from the flat tunnel to the uh, the west, I guess, or the northwest. And I remember taking the pictures and going, something's not right here. And what I ended up having to do was essentially taking the case off the phone and ripping off the plastic cover over the cameras so that, you know, I could take pictures without that blur that was happening on the... Uh, uh, on the photographs. And if you'll notice, um, the same thing has happened with this one. So I purchased this, uh, I got the camera, got the case back in August. And so what had happened was by the time I got to November, the, um, the cover had become scratched again and I was getting those blur on the picture. So I had to basically rip out that plastic piece. Uh, I guess what I'll be doing is contacting LifeProof and hopefully getting a replacement case for this. Um, and then basically, it'll go through the same process where it'll work for a while and then it'll get scratched and then I'll have to pull it off and um, kind of go from there. But again, that's kind of the drawback with having the multiple cameras on there. Just there's such a big surface area to, to protect and it's inevitable that the, the plastic part will get scratched on it. So um, now speaking of this big surface area with all of these multiple cameras on this, this has become sort of a big deal uh, when it comes to doing this type of um, documentation with your phone. So again, I use my phone a lot uh, to do this, um, to do these uh, historical explorations simply because it's convenient to have the phone with me. Um, again, when I'm riding my bike, um, I can put it on the holder uh, on my bike uh, I can use it to take photographs, but then I can use it to record all kinds of data. So I track all of my kilometers and things like that um, that I'm that I'm doing on there. Uh, helps with sort of the documentation of my hikes. Um, again, um, I can tuck it into uh, the pouch on my tactile vest if I have to get off the bike and go down the side of the grade or explore something. Um, you know, it's just it's a lot more convenient than having my SLR with me. Now, um, as I was saying, the idea of putting multiple cameras on the phone has been a godsend. Um, I know, you know, kind of using it in the past before I got my 
previous one, my iPhone 11, uh, there was oftentimes a bit of a challenge trying to photograph, again, some of those objects or some of those things that were kind of required kind of a wider angle. And it was a bit of a challenge because you just didn't, sometimes you don't physically have the ability to kind of get far enough back uh, to be able to do that and certainly so with my iPhone 11 having the wider camera on there and being able to get a bitter, bit bigger aspect a bit bigger um, field of view on the photograph was was tremendous right uh, obviously there's a bit of a compromise with that um, you're going to get you will notice on the pictures that there is a bit of distortion uh, on there right because um, obviously the wider you go uh, in order to facilitate that the lens uh, obviously has to have some curvature to it and um, you know it's like when I make my my uh, my videos and I'm using the GoPro the GoPro has such a wide field of view that you almost get sort of that almost fisheye view where the the sides of the the video will get are get distorted so you do get a little bit of that with the um um, with using the wide angle lens on the phone. But again, having that flexibility of having a dedicated wide angle camera, and right, you can flip flop in between and they're getting better, right? So for example, on the iPhone 11, um, the f-stop on the main camera was 1.8 and I think the wide angle camera was 2.2. Now on the 13, the f-stop on the, the main camera is 1.5, which is a very, very, um, uh, low aperture and then I think the wide angle camera is 1.8 right so um, you know gives you a, a, that ability to to be able to shoot in much darker conditions uh, which sometimes happens on these explorations and so the reason why I decided to upgrade into a, um, uh, a pro camera is because I wanted the the third camera I wanted the wide angle uh, sorry the telephoto lens uh, and again that comes in very helpful because if I'm not using an SLR right? Uh, I don't have that ability to, to change lenses and be able to sort of zoom in on an object and having that little bit of an extra zoom without sort of sacrificing quality, right? So traditionally on phones, you've been always able to zoom in, right? You pitch the screen and you kind of zoom in, right? And the problem is, is that obviously you're losing quality as you zoom in because it's a digital zoom. It's not an optical zoom, right? And so having that optical zoom, having that, that dedicated telephoto lens uh, allows you to do a few extra things things, uh, maybe get that right photograph or grab something in a little bit more detail that uh, you wouldn't always be able to. Uh, I've gone over sort of the pluses of using the phone before, um, uh, essentially being able to record uh, all of the data, particularly location data, right? So on, um, I don't know on how, uh, how it is with modern uh, SLR cameras. Uh, I know at the time I purchased mine, you basically had to buy a, a, a module uh, to record the GPS um, data and information. I think that still holds true with some of the some of the SLRs today, uh, where you do have to get that GPS module to uh, to record the ge to geolocate the, fo the photos. Um, so certainly that is an advantage of of using the phones beside the uh, beside the convenience. Now, when it comes time to uh, to actually use the phone itself, uh, and I'm going to try to put this up on the screen, uh, but what you may not be aware of is your ability to sort of manipulate the um, the photograph, right? So if I put this up on the screen, um, you can, I don't know if you can see that on there, you can basically touch the screen and that will change your focus point. And as well, you can be able to um, manipulate the, um, 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 the sensitivity. Uh, so basically manipulate your exposure so you can overexpose, underexpose, uh, what's happening with regard to the photograph. Um, again, I'll try to, I'll try to get um, uh, a little bit of sort of video footage of that, try to do a screen recording and be able to show you that. Uh, you can change, again, it's very useful to change your focus point. So just like you can with an SLR camera, right? You can manipulate where the camera is focusing on and where it's exposing on, right? Because sometimes I find that if I'm trying to photograph something and there's a contrast between kind of the dark and the light, um, the, the, the central focusing part is pretty good at sort of, um, weighting the, uh, the exposure using things like HDR high dynamic range, where you're kind of melding a whole bunch of different photographs together to give you kind of the best photo. 
So that's sort of a big advantage, but sometimes you do need to sort of manipulate things kind of on your own and be able to um, sort of change that focus point. And certainly as I'm describing this, as if I have some examples, uh, I can show you that um, as, you know, you can see photographs that uh, I've kind of taken multiple photographs, right? And you can see some that are kind of really kind of overexposed because um, the main sensor is picking up a lot of the light in the background or, um, you know, the, the, the other part of the photograph is too dark because it's picking up the light or, or vice versa or whatever it is. Being able to sort of manipulate that and change that is uh, is sort of a, a great bonus to have um, but essentially um, there's a lot you can do now again with uh, with having your uh, with your phone um, again as time goes on there's going to be more and more capabilities that are going to come up on this um, I don't know what they have planned for the future um, obviously by packing three cameras in the phone um, um, you know, sort of uh, that really expands your capability. I don't know what's going to happen in the future. I don't know if they're just going to keep adding cameras to the back of the phone, right? Where you're going to have, you know, more than three, four cameras, five cameras. Uh, I mean, I can see that being kind of a little bit awkward, uh, but certainly they, they will expand the capabilities of the cameras themselves. Again, you can just even see by the size of the lens, right? You know, going back to the, you know, the earlier cameras, you'd have this tiny, tiny little lens uh, that's on there. And certainly they've gotten a lot bigger in size and their ability to gather light uh, and their optical quality is, um, you know, again, it's very comparable to what you would see with, with, uh, with an SLR camera. Um, the megapixel size, I know the iPhone um, uh, 14, I know somebody that has a 14 and they were kind of complaining, geez, I'm trying to send people pictures and the, the pictures are like gigantic. I'm like, yeah, because um, this camera, this phone takes 12 megapixel pictures. The 14 has moved to a 24 megapixel sensor. So the picture size is huge compared to this. Uh, and obviously the more megapixels and the more detail and the the, uh, the sharper your pictures are going to be. So that's certainly a huge advantage. The only problem is, again, it just creates some issues with these massive sized files uh, that you have and does cause issues with regard to storing those, uh, those pictures, right? So um, most people are using sort of cloud-based storage where basically your phone kind of is syncing everything to the cloud. And those huge files uh, will certainly chew up uh, a lot of your storage space uh, on the cloud. I know for myself, I don't even know how many pictures I have in the cloud, like 13,000, something like that, some really ridiculous number of photographs. But uh, uh, again, that's one of the great things about this uh, is with the phone is the ability to kind of sync those photographs to the cloud uh, and give you some level of sort of redundancy because um, obviously it's not like a camera where you have an SD card and you can pull the SD card out and um, you know things like that. Uh, I know with my photographs what I do with this is um, they are stored on the cloud but any of the ones that I do for my historical explorations I actually um, um, use my computer and I download them and put them into a folder and then store them on a hard drive so the the pictures themselves um, are not only in the cloud, but they're all um, stored in, in files uh, on a hard drive and they're all arranged by date. So I can go back and look at a particular picture and, and or a particular area and be able to find that without searching through. And again, it provides a level of redundancy for me. Okay, so hopefully you've enjoyed today's episode. Uh, again, um, just kind of elaborating on photography a little bit. Um, I didn't even really sort of spend some time talking about sort of using the drone. I did kind of mention it in the previous episode a little bit, but uh, uh, I mean, that's a whole nother ballpark with sort of playing the drone. So maybe I'll, I'll do a specific episode talking more about the drone and using the drone uh, for photography and some of the challenges that are involved uh, with using that particular piece of technology, that device. Uh, for gathering photographs. Uh, anyway, um, we will be back next month with yet another episode. Um, I'm going to change gears a little bit and do something a little bit different. Uh, but again, we will come back to photography in the future. And so I appreciate everybody kind of tuning in. And certainly if you have any ideas for future episodes, please let me know in the comments something that you'd like me to cover, something you'd like me to talk about uh, with regard to some of the, the uh, equipment that I use for the hikes or even talking a little bit about the hikes and, and some of the historical document documentation uh, I do. Uh, so anyway, thanks for tuning in. And again, we'll be back next month with another episode. So in the meantime, stay safe and take care.